This video is brought to you and thanks to Brilliant, a problem-solving website that teaches you skills essential to have in this age of automation. In the past videos in this AI series, we have delved quite deep into the field of machine learning, discussing both supervised and unsupervised learning. The focus of this video then is to consolidate many of the topics we've discussed in the past videos and answer the question posed at the start of this machine learning series, the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning. As a quick recap, over the past two videos in the series, we have discussed both supervised and unsupervised learning, with them both being subsets of the field of machine learning. Supervised learning is when we have labeled, structured data, and the algorithms we are using determine the output based on the input data. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, is for unlabeled, unstructured data, where our algorithms of choice are tasked with deriving structure from unstructured data to be able to predict output data based on input data. Additionally, both supervised and unsupervised learning are further subsectioned 1. Regression, a supervised learning approach where the output is the value of a feature based on the correlation with another feature, that being on the continuous line of best fit our algorithm determines. 2. Classification, a supervised learning approach where the output is a label of a data point based on the category the point was in. There are a number of discrete categories whose decision boundaries are determined based on the algorithm we choose. 3. Clustering, an unsupervised learning approach where we must discover the categories various data points lie in based on the relationships of their features. 4. Association An unsupervised learning approach where we must discover the correlations of features in a dataset. As stated in the past, while it is nice to view these topics in their own little bubbles, often there's a lot of crossover between various techniques, for instance in the case of semi-supervised learning. This wasn't discussed previously, but it is essentially when our dataset contains both labeled and unlabeled data. So in this instance, when we have both these types of data, we may first cluster the data and then run classification algorithms on it, or a multitude of other combinations of techniques. So now, with the recap out of the way, and a general understanding of the types of machine learning, and the knowledge of all the terminology we have covered in the past videos, we can now begin to decipher what the term machine learning really means, and how it relates to artificial intelligence and other fields. As stated in the first video in this series, the term machine learning was coined by computing pioneer Arthur Samuel and is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. With such a broad definition, one can argue and would be correct in stating that all useful programs learn something. However, the level of true learning varies. This level of learning is dependent on the algorithms the programs incorporate. Now going back a few steps, an algorithm is a concept that has existed for centuries, since the dawn of human civilization. It is a term referring to a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem-solving operations. While anything can be referred to as an algorithm, such as a recipe for a food dish or the steps needed to start a fire, it is a term most commonly used to describe our understanding of mathematics and how it relates to the world around us, the informational fabric of reality. Progressing forward, with the rise of computing, essentially a field built on the premise of speeding up mathematical calculations, gave way to the birth of computer science, in which algorithms now define the processing, storing, and communication of digital information. The ability to iterate through algorithms at the lightning fast speed computers operate at over the past century has led to the implementation and discovery of various algorithms. To list a few, we have sorting algorithms like bubble sort and quicksort, shortest path algorithms like Dijkstra and A-star, and this list can go on and on for a variety of problems. These algorithms while able to perform tasks that appear to be learning are really just iteratively performing pre-programmed steps to achieve the results. In stark contrast to the definition of machine learning, to learn without explicit programming. Reflecting back on the past few videos in this series in which we've discussed the types of machine learning, both supervised and unsupervised, there is one common thread that runs through them both. To utilize a variety of techniques, approaches, and algorithms to form decision boundaries over a dataset's decision space. This divided up decision space is referred to as the machine learning model, and the process of forming the model, that being the decision boundaries in the dataset, is referred to as training. This training of a model draws parallels to the first primary type of knowledge we as humans display, declarative knowledge, in other words, memorization, the accumulation of individual facts. Once we have a trained model, and it is exhibiting good accuracy on training data, then we can use that model for the next step, inference. This is the ability to predict the outputs, whether that be a value or a category, of new data. Machine learning inference draws parallels to the second primary type of knowledge we exhibit, imperative knowledge. In other words, generalization, the ability to deduce new facts from old facts. Additionally, as the model encounters new data, it can use it to train further, refining its decision boundaries to become better at inferring future data. Now this whole process we just discussed is defined in the second most widely used definition of machine learning, stated by Dr. Tom Mitchell of Carnegie Mellon University. 
A computer is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T and performance measure P if its performance of tasks in T, as measured by P, improves with experience E. So while it is correct in stating that all useful programs learn something from data, I hope the distinction between the level of learning machine learning models and typical algorithms is now more clear. The rise of machine learning, domain-specific weak artificial intelligence as it is referred to, has been decades in the making. But first, what is artificial intelligence? As I hope you've learned from past videos in this series, AI refers to any model that can mimic, develop, or demonstrate human thinking, perception, or actions. In our case, this refers to computing-based AI. In our first two videos in this AI series, The History and Birth of AI, we saw the development of the field of artificial intelligence, from trying to develop a more general AI, also called a strong AI, to focusing on acquiring domain-specific expertise in various fields. This turning point in the field of AI was due to expert systems in the 80s, essentially complex conditional logic, that being if-then-else statements that were tailored for a respective field of knowledge by experts in that field. At the end of that Birth of AI video, the time period we left off on was the AI bust, which was at the start of the 90s, a low point in the AI hype cycle due to overpromises made on what expert systems could really do. After this point, the development of intelligent systems went into the background due to the lack of funding and mainstream interest in the field and the rapid technological progress made in so many other fields, from the invention of the internet, commercialization of computers, mobile phones, the list can go on and on. During this time period in the 90s, expert systems and algorithms originally developed by AI researchers began to appear as parts of larger systems. These algorithms had solved a lot of very difficult problems, and their solutions proved to be useful throughout the technology industry, such as data mining, industrial robotics, logistics, speech recognition, banking software, medical diagnosis, and Google's search engine to list a few. However, the field of AI received little or no credit for these successes in the 1990s and early 2000s. Many of the field of AI's greatest innovations had been reduced to the status of just another item in the tool chest of computer science. As Nick Bostrom, author of Superintelligence, stated in 2006, a lot of cutting-edge AI has filtered into general applications, often without being called AI, because once something becomes useful enough and common enough, it is not labeled AI anymore. This is similar to what John McCarthy, the father of AI, also stated back in the 80s. So then, what started changing in the late 2000s and at the start of this decade that propelled the field of AI once again to the forefront? Well first off, we can thank the increase of computing power and storage, infinite computing, big data, and various other topics we've covered in videos past. These advances allowed for large amounts of data to train on, and the computing power and storage needed to be able to do so. Now one can say that finding structure and data is a human condition. It's how we've come so far, and these advances gave computers what they required to do so as well. Now as you can see here, the difference between various AI breakthroughs and the date the algorithms were initially proposed is nearly two decades. However, on average, just three years after the dataset for a said problem becomes available does the breakthrough happen, meaning that data was a huge bottleneck in the advancement of the field of AI. The next reason for the rise of machine learning is due to the rise of a particular tribe of machine learning, connectionism, or as many commonly know of it, deep learning. Before we delve into deep learning, let's first discuss the other tribes of AI. There are five primary tribes of machine learning, with tribes referring to groups of people who have different philosophies on how to tackle AI-based problems. We have discussed many of these tribes in past videos, but this list below should make them more concrete. The first tribe is the Symbolists. They focus on the premise of inverse deduction. They don't start with a premise to work towards conclusions, but rather use a set of premises and conclusions and work backwards to fill in the gaps. We discussed this in the History of AI video, and will focus on it more heavily in a future video on artificial human intelligence. The second tribe is the Connectionists. They mostly try to digitally re-engineer the brain and all of its connections in a neural network. The most famous example of the connectionist approach is what is commonly known as deep learning. We discussed parts of the rise of connectionism in the Birth of AI video. The third tribe is the evolutionaries. Their focus lies on applying the idea of genomes and DNA and the evolutionary process to data processing. Their algorithms will constantly evolve and adapt to unknown conditions and processes. You have probably seen this style of approach used in beating games such as Mario, and we will discuss it much more in an upcoming video on reinforcement learning. The fourth tribe is the Bayesians. Bayesian models will take a hypothesis and apply a type of a priori thinking, believing that there will be some outcomes that are more probable. They then update their hypothesis as they see more data. We discussed a bit more about this line of thinking in our video on quantum computing. The fifth and final tribe is the analogizers. This machine learning tribe focuses on techniques to match bits of data to each other. We have been discussing this approach quite a bit in the past few videos, with many core concepts of supervised and unsupervised learning tied to it. 
How I think it would be best to represent these tribes of artificial intelligence and machine learning is in a bubble diagram format. To start with, we have our primary AI bubble and machine learning bubble. We show this relationship in the first video in our machine learning series. Now after this, we can add the tribe bubbles. They're constantly moving and overlapping with each other to produce novel ideas and shrinking and growing in popularity. Once a tribe hits mainstream popularity, such as connectionism, it pops, so to speak, producing a new field in its wake. In the case of connectionism, it was deep learning. Keep in mind that just because connectionism grew into deep learning doesn't mean that the entire tribe of connectionism is centered around deep learning. The connectionism bubble and many connectionists will continue researching new approaches utilizing connectionist theory. Also, deep learning isn't all connectionism. There are many symbolist and analogous philosophies incorporated within as well. You can learn more about the five tribes of machine learning in Pedro Dominguez's book, The Master Algorithm, which goes very in-depth into the topics we just talked about and also goes over topics we will cover in future videos in this series. Coming back on topic, so then what is the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence? Nothing and everything. While machine learning is classified as a type of AI since it exhibits the ability to match and even exceed human-level perception and action in various tasks, it as stated earlier is a weak AI, since these tasks are often isolated from one another, in other words domain-specific. As we've seen, machine learning can mean many things, from millions of lines of code with complex rules and decision trees, to statistical models, symbolist theories, connectionism and evolution-based approaches, and much more, all with the goal to model the complexities of life, just as how our brains try to do. With the advent of big data, the increases in computing power and storage, and the other factors we discussed earlier and in videos past, took these models from simpler iterative algorithms to those involving many complex domains of mathematics and science working together in unison, such as knot theory, game theory, linear algebra, and statistics to list a few. One important note to touch on with these models, no matter how advanced the algorithms used, is best said through a quote by famous statistician George Box. All models are wrong, but some are useful. By this, it is meant that in every model, abstractions and simplifications are made, such that they will never 100% model reality. However, simplifications of reality can often be quite useful in solving many complex problems. Relating to machine learning, this means we will never have a model that has an accuracy of 100% in predicting an output in most real-world problems, especially in more ambiguous problems. Two of the major assumptions made in the field of machine learning that is the cause of this is that 1. We are assuming that the past, that being the patterns of the past, predict the future and two, that mathematics can truly model the entire universe. Regardless of these assumptions, these models can still be very useful in a broad array of applications. We will cover these grander societal impacts of weak intelligence in an upcoming video on the evolution of AI. Additionally, a method that has been attributed to a major rise in the accuracy of models and something we mentioned earlier is deep learning, which we will cover in the next set of videos in this AI series. Now before concluding, one important fact that I want to reiterate, and as stated in the disclaimer at the start of all my AI videos, is that my goal here is to try and simplify, in reality, very complex topics. I urge you to seek out additional resources on this platform and various others if you wish to learn more on a much deeper level. One such resource I use and highly recommend is Brilliant. If you want to learn more about machine learning, and I mean really learn how these algorithms work, from supervised methodologies such as regression and classification, to unsupervised learning and more, then Brilliant.org is a place for you to go. Now what we love about how the topics in these courses are presented is that first an intuitive explanation is given, and then you are taken through related problems. If you get a problem wrong, you see an explanation for where you went wrong and how to rectify that flaw. In a world where automation through algorithms will increasingly replace more jobs, it is up to us as individuals to keep our brains sharp and think of creative solutions to multidisciplinary problems, and Brilliant truly is a platform that allows you to do so. For instance, beyond the courses Brilliant offers, every day there is a daily challenge that can cover a wide variety of topics in the STEM domain. These challenges are crafted in such a way in which they draw you in, and then allow you to learn a new concept through their intuitive explanations. To support Futurology and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash futurology and sign up for free. Additionally, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. At this point, the video has concluded. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch it. If you enjoyed it, consider supporting us on Patreon or YouTube membership to keep this brand growing. And if you have any topic suggestions, please leave them in the comments below. Consider subscribing for more content and check out our website and our parent company Earth One for more information. This has been Encore, you've been watching Futurology, and we'll see you again soon.